Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Diluting Juice. No, Under Whiskey uh, podcast. <laughs> I'll start it up. We already have <laughs> One Nation Under Rum. <laughs> now we're One Nation Under Diluting Juice. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always by my good friend, my business partner, the dear Mr. Jason Johnston Yellen. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am I am joined today and as always during this hour mm. with my eldest child in band class. All right. And so I am being serenaded with a bass clarinet playing the White Stripes' Seven Nation Army as uh, <laughs> as I record. So if, if listeners can hear... The, the faint bass hum of Seven Nation Army, you're not imagining it. Mm. it. It is real. It is true. It is in the background of my recording. So my question to you is, you know, obviously he's, he's doing band class from home. He's being not homeschooled, but he's doing the distance learning. Indeed. Is that an actual song given to him by the music teacher? Or does he say, screw all those... Screw Claire de Lune, I'm going to play Seven Nation Army. <laughs> oh, no. So apparently, so he's now in eighth grade. And so in eighth grade, oh, so in eighth grade band, mm-hmm. they, they really start preparing you for high school band and high school marching band. Uh, and so he's starting to play a whole bunch of, of bars that you hear at, at college mm-hmm. sports and high school sports. Um, he can also do Another One Bites the Dust. Uh, he has that going on the bass clarinet. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we've got a lot of snippets happening. There's not a lot of classical music happening uh, at this juncture. When someone decides to be, you know, a musician of an alternate instrument, right? Like your son, bass clarinet. Do they have the... Uh, what am I trying to get at here? So my so my point is, <laughs> like I'm seeing him in a band, and I'm thinking of the potential songs he could play, and I'm trying to think of <laughs> where else do you see marching bands? Well, you see them sometimes in sporting events, and then I'm going down this thought rabbit hole of who else plays in sporting events, and that is pipe organ players, right? Do, okay. pipe, do pipe organ players play anything other than I think a lot of them uh, supplement their income with Sunday services at local oh, churches. Oh, that checks out. And so do oftentimes they... ministers, yeah, ministers will come to the, to the pulpit <laughs> accompanied by that soundtrack. Yeah, yeah so like... Being a Jew, I don't go to church much. Do do Christians when they go to church? Is it like? Do, 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 do. Yep, it wow. is. Wow. Yep, all of all of our our Christian nation members oh. and and Christian listeners will attest to that. Yep, hundred percent. Wow, and that, is that yep. as you're walking up to to take the cracker. A hundred percent. Yep. You're, yeah, yep. Okay. Your amalgamation of multiple world religions into yeah. one single cracker is spot on. Absolutely spot on. <laughs> impenetrable, Joshua. <laughs> You're impenetrable. Every day's a yes. school day, Jason. I'm really enjoying this. So thank you. You're... <laughs> You're impressing me with your knowledge of world religions <laughs> that do not check the Judaism box. They do not. Um, so here, I want to return to something. Now that we've got the, the band issue and, and where does one play bass clarinet mm. uh, out of the way, I want to return to something that we picked up in the last episode of One Nation Under Whiskey, mm-hmm. where we interviewed the wonderful Will Oldham and had a, a fantastic chat with him. And and in our intro in that episode, I'd ask you the question, what is whiskey for? And we, mm-hmm. we talked about, you know, multiple bottles and uh, archiving bottles and the stories attached to bottles. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that that I didn't get to in in that portion of the conversation, and I also have to say thank you to, to Dr. Whiskey himself, Sam Simmons, who emailed to say, 
what is whiskey for? That is the question we should all be asking. Mm. So kudos for, for covering that. And so one of the things that, that strikes me, if I'm sitting watching a movie, watching TV, even, even reading a book and, and dramming, mm-hmm. I invariably will ask myself the question, would I have bottled this? You know, you know, it, it, and that's not just for for independently bottled single casks. You know, I, I'm sitting drinking Arbeg Wee Beastie. I'm sitting drinking yeah. Lagavulin Eight Year Old, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm asking myself, what's what's happening in these whiskies? Why why is this the batch? Why is this the release? Why is this the flavor profile? Mm-hmm. And and I invariably get to to some some positions you know i'm, I'm not going to name names but but there there are times actually i, I will name names cuz this was actually quite interesting i i picked up a this was an auction in, in glasgow which one the whiskey shop auctions mm-hmm. run by our our good friend christopher halstrom i picked up a dalmunach oh as bottled by duncan taylor in the Octaves series. Okay. Yep. And and, and the reason that I'm, I'm okay naming names on this one is because you and I actually had a conversation about this. Mm-hmm. And so this this is a three year old Dalmunach that spent some short period of time in Octaves. It's a 2016. I can see how you're looking at me. It's yeah, because I 16. Yeah, but I thought it was. I thought it had just hit four years old. That's why I'm giving you the the face. Yes, yeah, so it's it's broken down a little more than that. So aged three years in oak casks. Oh right. <laughs> and 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 then months in octave three. And and so there's no precise dating on it, but yeah, it is obviously it's over three years old. It has not turned four. It was distilled in 2016. It was bottled in 2020. And those are all the dates I've got. Three okay. years in oak, three months in an octave. So this came in uh, from Scotland, uh, thanks to our, our good friend, uh, our global sales manager Jess Lomas, and and I opened it, you know, on a you know Friday night, a Shabbat, got it open, and and I I know it's young, right? The the thing that's most exciting about it is that it's from the Dalmunic Distillery. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I'm sure the majority of our listeners know Dalmunic Distillery is the distillery built on the site of the closed and demolished Imperial Distillery. Mm-hmm. And so given Joshua's love of Imperial, we we pay closer attention to Dalmunic than we probably should. <laughs> it's only on a site. It's yeah, only right. on a patch of ground. <laughs> There's no reason for this to be <laughs> more pressing than any other distillery. <laughs> but these, these are the types of things that I indulge Joshua in. So, and so... So I, I poured it and I'm sitting there, I'm drinking it. And and later on in my follow-up with you, I was saying, yeah, it, it, it's clearly young, it's clearly youthful, it's clearly spirity. Uh, the three months in octave haven't really pushed along that much. And, and so the, the first question is, is it good or not? I, I, I can't really answer that, right? Because because I think the question is incomplete, right? Is it is it a good young example from a new distillery yeah (laughs) is it a Mm. good scotch whiskey larger category no (laughs) right because it's not really doing what scotch whiskey does right which are you know nice big bold robust flavors you know Mm -hmm. this is youthful this is promising this is a peek into the future that's why i bought it I didn't buy it as if it was a 12-year-old, you know, fully developed Scotch whiskey. I bought it to have a peek into the future. But I think the question of is it a good whiskey is not necessarily an incomplete question. I think it's the wrong question. I think the correct question is did you enjoy it? Well, let me move beyond that question and say (laughs) my, my question was, was it of value, right? Was it of value purchasing this, tasting this, having a peek into the future? Because did I enjoy it? No, I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, um, and right, and that's and that's and right? that's fair. Yeah, but did it have value? Yeah, 
Yes, it did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Am I glad Duncan Taylor bottled this? Yes, I am. Am I glad that I bought it? Yes, I am. Did I enjoy it? Not particularly. Would I reach for it again? Not particularly. Would I pour it if, you know, once the end times are over, um, you come to my house, would I pour this for you? This might be one of the first things I pour for you coming in the door. It's probably if, be the first if, thing I ask for too. <laughs> right. If whiskey loving friends come by the house, it might very well be the first thing I pour for them coming in the door. So it absolutely has value, even if, and, and this is all the way back to why we're having this conversation, as I'm sitting there of an evening pouring this, mm. I couldn't help but ask myself, would I bottle this? Which is always my question, right? And you can't answer that. I couldn't answer it without a caveat, which was I wouldn't bottle it as an expression of good, complete whiskey. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know if, and this is why you and I are having this conversation today, I didn't know if you and I would even bottle this as a peek into the future. And one of the things that we're always yeah. talking about is what are independent bottlers doing differently from one another? And if Duncan Taylor want to bottle a youthful peek into the future that's an incomplete Scotch whiskey, mm. I think that's perfectly fine. I think I have no qualms with that at all, but... I don't think that's one of our remits. I don't think that's a thing we would necessarily do. Well, to be honest, if if that is the reason why Duncan Taylor bottled it, I find it somewhat surprising that that would come from Duncan Taylor and not from Pernod Ricard themselves to show this is what's coming, right? When you think about... Kilcarran, right? The Glengyle Distillery, and they did the work in progress. So you could see that. You could see how that whiskey is coming along. That makes sense because you have the producer saying, follow us along this journey. Kilhoman did the same thing with their quarterly spring release, autumn release, and everything like that. From the producer, a glimpse, a glimpse into, hey, check out how our whiskeys is progressing makes good sense. Do I like that Duncan Taylor did did this? Without a doubt, because Perno Ricard typically does not release Dalmenic. I think there's a distillery-only bottling of it that was made available. But I find it interesting that if that's the reason why Duncan Taylor bottled it, and, and we don't know for, for sure, but it's a, a very unusual approach for an independent bottler to say, check how this distillery is doing. I'm surprised you're surprised. I would not expect <laughs> Pernod Ricard, you know, given the size that they are, given the projects that they have, I would not expect them to be the ones releasing a Del Monarch. I would not to either. To put out yeah, no, I, a I'm, work in progress. I'm not suggesting that I would expect them to do it. What I'm saying is it would make more sense if they d had done it, just like Kilhoman had done it. I'm talking about the producer themselves. If they're to be putting out a single malt to say, hey, follow us along this journey, and there's precedence for that. But in the case of this Dalmunic, Dalmunic is not being released as single malt. It's being produced primarily for blend. I, I, I guess I just... Not that I expect Perno Ricard to be showing us a work in progress. I'm just surprised that an independent bottler would be doing that rather than the producer. That's all. Well, I will say I'm not fully up to date on independently bottled releases of Dalmunic. Mm -hmm. You know, we're certainly not seeing a lot of them. I don't know exactly how many are out there. If you're Duncan Taylor, you have an unencumbered route to market. Mm -hmm. You can be one of the very first to put out a Dalmanach. If the question is, are we okay putting out a three years in oak and a three months in octave single malt scotch whiskey, right? And I think if, if that route has nobody else on it, yeah. Go crazy. Yeah. Knock yourself yeah, out. Yeah, Put I it guess. out there. I, I think that makes perfect. I think 
That, to me, makes more sense than Pernod Ricard having a conversation around a boardroom table. Like, should we put out a three-year-old Dalmanac? <laughs> no, no, save it for blends. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if they were an independently owned distillery or owned by a smaller company, then I think they may have the freedom to do something like that. That's, you know, again, I never expected Pirino Ricard to be doing what you're suggesting to show the potential work in progress. I'm just saying independent distilleries have done that. So the story but, coming from the correct. distillery would make a bit more sense. That's all. Correct, 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 correct. And, and that, that, that I do agree with. But just in listening to you, listen to the size of the distilleries you're talking about who took charge of that narrative and then look at Pernod Ricard. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clearly don't need to bring in any money to keep the lights on at Dalmanach while they're waiting on stock to mature. So, so but anyway, so, so to, to put this question back to you then, if I'm sitting there of an evening... Mm-hmm inevitably getting to that point where I say, would I bottle this? Would we bottle this? Do, what kind of internal questions do you have? Are you able to switch off your brain? Are you able to just throw whiskey over your throat as you're watching a movie, reading a, whatever you read? Yeah. Listening to an audiobook. Yeah. I, 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 I do that a, f- a fair amount. I, especially as of late during COVID, right? I've been, I've either been A, not not drinking at all, uh, or B, if I am, I'm kind of looking for something that I don't want to necessarily think about too much. So I'm looking at very easy whiskeys because I'm just tired of thinking all the time. And so... <laughs> And so that's, you know, that, that's been the space that I've been living in. However, in normal times, I quite often think, would Jason and I bottle this? Does this, does it, sometimes I think about it from the standpoint of does it meet our standards? And sometimes, right, if it's something like a wee beastie or something like that, if I'm drinking something young, I think, Five years, that's, you know, we've done the young age statements before, but we've also, we've we've never gotten burned by the young age statements, but young age statements are always a much slower sell for us. And so, you know, age will play a part, cask type will play a part, color can play a part. Um, I'm sorry, how long did it take us to sell out our two-year-old milk and honey? Was it, Was that a long while? Was that a slow burner? Right, that wasn't. But we've had Westlands that were, and we've had Catoctin Creeks that were. and But I think you're comparing two times in the company that are incommensurable. Like, okay. I don't think you can say the way the nation stood five years ago and where the nation stands now, we have a hard time selling young age statements. And now we're sitting, we're still sitting on some 19-year-old Orkney, <laughs> right? It's, it's <laughs> like... It's it almost doesn't make sense what sells and why and and but but still I have to think about that from from an age statement. Go ahead. Just when you bring up the Westland, the Catoctin Creek, and we're talking the milk and honey, I I, I do think when we released each of those and, and we did the Colhoman four year old as well, mm-hmm. I didn't think we were bottling those as a a peek into the future no. for the distilleries. No. We bottled those as whiskies to drink, to enjoy right now. These are good examples, good expressions. And to speak to what you were mentioning a moment ago, I do think the hurdle that still has to be cleared when bottling young age statement whiskies is the perception of the person to whom we are selling. I think if you're a member of the mm-hmm. nation and you see a two-year-old Westland and a two-year-old Catoctin Creek, then a three-year-old Catoctin Creek, and you see a two-year-old Milk and Honey, you're thinking to yourself, mm, these are these are a bit young. These are, mm-hmm. these are peaks into the future. Mm-hmm. And that's not our intention. At all, you know, no. They are standalone whiskeys, and we certainly thought of them that way when we released them. 
so as we're as we're talking about this, you know, it, it's it's interesting. We we think about how we're selling to our to our customers, to our nation members, why we would bottle something, how they would receive it, how they would perceive it. There is a connection here to today's guest, who's Robin Cooper of the Campari Group, and this is what he thinks about, thought about, continues to think about quite a lot as someone, now granted this isn't his title anymore, but as someone who'd spent years and years and years being a brand manager, and how does he work with the distilleries he's with to create a product that connects with the consumers, right? And is it is it from a juice standpoint? Do they have to change that up? Is it a, appealing packaging? Like it or not, as much as you and I are not color guys from a whiskey standpoint, we do go online, we see a bottle on auction, we say, oof, look at the color on that. And everybody does. And then you see a sexy label, like, ooh, that's a sexy label, right? You and I create sexy labels for our our woodcut series and for our Jubilee bottlings and so forth, right? It's all forms of brand management. And and this is one of the things that I, I quite enjoyed, and our, our listeners will hear it in just a little bit, but just hearing the thought process behind brand management and brand development, brand redesign, I, I thought it was... A pretty fascinating conversation between the three of us. Well, and, and now an even wider title for Robin, brand advocate. Right. So yeah. he's now involved in the advocacy of Glen Grant, Wild Turkey, mm-hmm. other non-whiskey yeah. related Campari products. Like that's that's a it's an interesting title when you first hear it, brand mm. advocate. But, but to then unpack it and to listen to not just the things Robin has learned during his career in the industry, but also the aspects that Robin continues to try to put in place for his brands as he continues mm-hmm. his career within the industry. Yeah, he's, he's a fascinating chap. And I would, I would implore our listeners to check out his Instagram interviews. Mm-hmm. He's doing whiskey chats, he's called them. Whiskey chats Hashtag on Instagram. Whiskey chats. Yeah. Hashtag whiskey chats. And and you and I happened to be on that a couple of weeks ago. But but it's it's just a dude, a bit like you and I when we're sitting here kind of waxing lyrical, he's just a dude who chats whiskey and, and has this lovely experience and and I'm trying not to say you know lengthy career I'm not trying to say you're old Robin um <laughs> but he, he's one of the few people I get to talk to his hair is a similar color um his is more gray than uh, you know white um and so yeah he he brings a, a you know a lifetime of experience to his chats mm-hmm. and, and hopefully that is conveyed in today's interview and hopefully we don't derail him too much with our nonsense. I don't think we did. Um, before we hand it over to our conversation with Robin, I want to let people know Robin was recording using his, you know, just local microphone on his laptop and there are a few times where the audio kind of cuts out for maybe part of a word or a word and you may hear it but just just pay close attention to that you may hear a word drop out here and there but so long as you're paying attention to the conversation you will get all the contextual clues you need to uh to stay informed to stay a part of the conversation i should say and just for the record joshua i know and our listeners know that you take editing and production values very seriously and i can see it in your face i hope our listeners can hear it in your voice it just cuts you to your quick a little bit to have anything less than a flawless product going out the door but good on you good on you for still allowing us to release this interview it's the least i could do jason literally The 
firstly, Robin, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm, thank you. I'm trying to figure out how long Jason and I have, have known you and have bumped into you over the years. Is it, It's probably been a good 10 years at least, right? Yeah, it's taken you 10 years to invite me on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them come and go, you know. The babies, they've grown up, they've moved on. And now, after 10 years, I finally got on your show. <laughs> the waiting is the hardest part, Robin. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it was ten years ago when, because um, you you started out with a jubilee in New York. Yeah, in 2012. Okay, so it, was that the first time we met? That was probably the first time we met on a, a professional basis but I, i'm sure i've you know i've been to a whiskey fest or a whiskey live or something like that and have gone to to your to your table whether you know who knows what what you would what would have you yeah what would you have been pouring 10 years ago what was in your portfolio what were you responsible for gosh 10 years ago that it would have been glenn rothis oh, okay yep but i, I came to the u.s um, in March 2003, flew to Florida and then then to Kentucky and then finally to California in you know a matter of two weeks. But and I was on Glen Morangia and Ard Beg. Hmm. But I I mean I started way back in the industry before that. Okay, well let's for our listeners who 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 may not be familiar with you. Obviously, we, we are familiar with you, and there are things specifically we want to discuss. Uh, but if you could give our listeners just uh, read off your CV. What, what's on your resume? What do you have under your belt? So, well, um, so I started, um, I think, January 94 at Port Dundas, Glasgow. So... Hmm. Port Dundas was a big grain distillery, yeah. and um, behind the distillery was the uh, an office building, and that's where all of the sort of logistics, the planning, the production across fifty seven bottling lines took place. Hmm. So you would have Landon in Essex, where they bottled the, the gin, mm-hmm. Gordon Tanqueray for America. You would have Shield Hall in Glasgow where they bought Bells and White Horse, Vat 69. Sure. Um, Johnny Walker was bottled at Kilmarnock. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Classic Malts uh, and, and and several other blends were all bottled up in Leaven and Fife. So that was 57 bottling lines. So I was in the team that looked after Asia and the US. So my job was to make sure that we had all the caps, the glass, the labels, outer shippers we call them the cases mm-hmm. uh, sure that was all ready so that we could actually book the production spots wow and then after that so i did that for approximately a, about a year and then i moved to perth and perth jason i mean you, you which part of scotland are you from jason airshire oh, are you from airshire i'm, okay. I'm from air oh okay yeah. so perth's the other side of the country um i mean it's a small country i mean <laughs> Hop, skip, and a jump. Uh, but uh, Perth is, um, I mean, my family actually come from Perthshire, you know, way, way back. My name, Cooper, C-O-U-P-R is a Perthshire name. But, you know, and Perth was the big one of the big Scotch capitals. And because you had, you know, you had Bells. So I went moved from, from the productions like Glasgow up to Bells, where we had the UK channel trade marketing headquarters. So I was on the team that, you know, we, we did all the marketing for the, the specialist channel. So that would be all the, you know, the liquor store, all the off licenses they're called in the UK. Uh, specialty liquor so, shops and such? Yeah, and I mean, there's a quite, yeah. chain, it's quite a chain dominant. So you guys are in the East Coast, so there's not many big chains out there. Many, many of them are independent sort mm. of, family-owned liquor stores. You have that in the UK, but you have a lot of um, chains. Like in those days, you had Oddbins, Victoria Wines, Haddo's in Scotland. So yeah. we would have programs, so Father's Day. So I, my job was to make sure that 
we had all the stuff and it was going to the right place. Kind of not a sexy side of the industry. That was to, to come a wee bit later. But Perth was an interesting place. I mean, my dad lives in Perth um, right now. and But, you know, you had, um, in the early days, you had um, famous grouse. Mm. You know, they were based in Perth. So you had bells, famous grouse. And then you had Jewers. And my grandfather, Jewers had their big sort of production facility in Perth, down at Inveramend. And my grandfather, you know, before and after World War I, would, you know, there would be lots of jobs going uh, in those days, you know, in the summer holidays or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, treasury work, as it were. And he would be packing bottles of Jewers. And the big market for Jewers in those days was the US. So... Anyway, so I, I was at Perth, and, and then um, then then the companies decided to merge. It was United Distillers I worked for, Johnny Walker, and quite a few of the blends. We're a very Scotch heavy company, and then what happens is Johnny Walker or, or United Distillers merges with a company called. Well, sorry, take a step back. United Distillers is taken over by Guinness, and then a few years later, Guinness. United Distillers merged with Grand Metropolitan, who, who owned Burger King, Hagen Dash ice cream, but they owned International Vintners and Distillers, which was which was J and B, oh, okay. Schmernot, yeah. So it became basically it became Diageo. Yeah, yep. The biggest spirits company in the world. So basically, they closed the office in Perth and they opened the office in London, and of course. That was to the detriment of all the staff, the Scottish staff, who had, but up to that time, worked very much in the Scottish whisky industry. Mm. So all these jobs were moved down south, and I wasn't prepared to, all my friends, family up in Scotland, so, you know, I, I, I started looking for a job, and I got a job with Glenn Morangy, mm -hmm. and, um, and I joined just after, I mean, literally, it was a month after the company had, I'd acquired Ardbeg Distillery. Okay, so that, what was that, 97-ish? That, that was, yes, I think it was February 97. Okay, okay. 97. Oh, 98. 97, 98. Yeah. No, 98, because I joined and in, in, I'd come, I'd gone to the World Cup it was in France. Scotland played Brazil mm -hmm. first game. Mm -hmm. You remember that? The one-one draw. Mm -hmm. Thought we were going to qualify. You know, Pff, it never happened. But <laughs> <laughs> and I came back and I got my redundancy letter. And then within a few weeks, I managed to get this job at Glenmo. And the company had just acquired Ardbeg. So okay. okay. And what was your so I worked for the, uh, what was your capacity sorry. there when when you were hired by them? So I, I kind of managed the, the America's desk, as it were. I was the sort of fat controller, sort of um, making sure the budgets were right. And I, I sort of managed this, sort of managed. I reported to this sort of regional guy who was based in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. The reason why he was based there was because our importer in the U.S. was Brown Foreman. Oh, okay. So they were the Glen Morangy importer. Yeah. So within a couple of years, they, you know, I... I speak Spanish and, and I was given this amazing opportunity to be the sales manager for Latin America. Hmm. So I traveled down to, I mean, mainly Caracas because Venezuela was, the, in those days, was the third or fourth biggest Scotch market in the world. Wow. People ask, why? Why? Well, because they had oil. And of course, ah. oil-rich Venezuela, you know, they wanted a prestigious drink. And of course, Scotch whiskey, hmm absolutely plays into that mm -hmm. but it's it was a very much a blended scotch whiskey market. okay and then something happened the venezuela there was a sort of a kind of military coup and um the it, the country got taken over by a kind of marxist corrupt regime which still was actually um there today and it's turned their that oil rich country into a you know backward you know disaster I mean, it's a disaster now, but it was once, um, you know, a, one of the third or fourth. It, I think at one time it was actually the second biggest Scotch market in the world. Amazing. And now hmm. it's just off, completely off the map. But 
that's when they sent me over to the US as a brand ambassador for Glenn Morangy and Ardbeg. And then I, it was supposed to be for two years, but it, this is, I mean, it will be 18 years in March. <laughs> it's funny how that happens, right? You just kind of hang around a little bit longer and one job leads to another. Yeah, life, life can so happen. When did, yeah. <laughs> when did Campari come a knocking? Well, so. Or, or was there even another step? Because obviously we know these mergers happen yes. continuously. Um, and it's, so it's, was there another? Yeah, so, so, um, so I came here as Glen Orange is a family controlled company. Um, listed on the London Stock Exchange, but you know, all the voting rights and the majority of the shares were owned by a family. So it gave Glen Morangy, you know, a little bit of a extra wiggle room. We could do stuff that, you know, some of the, the big companies, you know, we could do things quicker, let's say. Mm. Um, and 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 the company really recognized the US as a really fast growing market because single malt really was the first craft spirit really in, in the market. Yeah. Well, how people think about craft spirits now, they think about pot still or a you know limited apparatus, small production. That's exactly what Scotch, single malt Scotch was then. I mean, it's changed now. I mean, a lot of the big brands have gone through rapid expansion. But so um, what happened was that the family decided they couldn't take the brand any further. Um, so they decided to cash out. And of course, the brand goes up for sale. And um, there's a several suitors, including, you know, I think, I think Diageo were discounted because of, you know, they're becoming a monopoly. Mm. The Mergers and Monopolies Commission in the UK probably wouldn't have allowed that. But I think William Grants was sniffing around. Brown Foreman was certainly in the game because, of course, they already had the brand in the US and they'd, they'd taken it to something like 30,000 cases. Wow. But it was LVMH that came in and paid... You know, I think a little bit more, um, but they they had a you know a long term vision. They clearly recognised single malt Scotch as a as, as pure a luxury category, which it is, and um, they've taken it to the next level. Now I stayed on for a little bit, but I got a call one day. You know, I'm thinking, you know, LVMH doesn't know much about Scotch, and I do. I mean, this could be a great journey for me. But then I got a call from a headhunter and I thought, I, I, couldn't, I didn't really want the person on, on, the, on the call. And they said, look, there's a company here called Sky. And I, you know, I knew the Sky Vodka, the brand. Sure. But they've got, a, they've got a, a brand called Glen Rothes. It's a small brand, but they, um, they quite like to have somebody who knows a little bit about the category. Can you come and you know, be the brand manager? And um, so I sort of thought about it and I thought, why not? So, um, you know, that, that sort of took me into the kind of sky, sky world, which at that time was now owned by the Italians. You know, Campari, you know, owned the company. Their name was above the, the door, as it were. And then they had the Boris and Bowmore brand. They, uh, we had, of course, Campari had bought Glenn Grant. We're now, you know, into the bourbon business and, and was also with Wild Turkey, of course, Russell's Reserve. And um, we also had the Suntory whiskies, and we launched the Suntory whiskies where nobody really knew much about Japanese whiskey. Mm -hmm. So all of it came together. So suddenly I'm like, Scotch, and we had Tullamore Dew as well. We have Bourbon now. We have Japanese whiskey. We've got this incredible portfolio of of single malt, Bomo, Ockintosh, and Glen Geary, Glen Rothis, Glen Grant. I mean, at one time we had more tables than Pono and Diageo at Whiskey Fest. I wow. mean. Can you believe? It? I mean, it's, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do remember that that time frame when you had the Suntory brands when that was part of sort of the Sky yeah. portfolio. Yeah, no, it was interesting because you know, you know, we all know what happened to Japanese whiskey uh, in recent years, but I, I distinctly remember, you know, we, Lincoln Henderson was our uh, brand ambassador. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, of course, Lincoln Henderson, who was the distiller who really put out Woodford and, and, you know, designed that whole, you know, production method with using pot stills, etc. So he had retired and he was a, a brand am ambassador. So he was a bourbon legend, you know, represent repping a, a Japanese whiskey. And people would come up and say, 
And they would sort of recoil in sort of horror and disbelief. That, What's this, a Japanese scotch? <laughs> so, well, no, it's a Japanese whiskey. I mean, it's not made in Scotland, it's Japanese. And, and then he started, they, they started you know, winning the accolades. They start, Jim Murray, obviously, they won his heart. Um, and then they, they start really focusing on the art of Japanese cocktailing. And they start really to, they fo really, really focused hard on those sort of whiskey, dark spirits people. People like us, really. Yeah. Yep. And, and it, boom. <laughs> it just, they, we couldn't keep it in stock after that. So tie a bow in this for us. So obviously now there's Beam Suntory. Mm. Obviously, there's Campari. What what happened with Sky? What, what yeah, was so, the end of that? When you went from all these tables, yeah. what what got tied up, and and now what's your focus? So Campari and um, Suntory had you know partnerships, distribution agreements in a lot of markets across Asia, across Europe, even in the UK. I mean, uh, and North America. But then Suntory surprised a lot of people. I mean, even people within Morris and Beaumont who were, you know, part of the Suntory network. But it, it was a big surprise that, you know, and we all saw it in the sort of same time everybody else did, that, you know, Suntory had bought B. And um, mm -hmm. so that really kind of, you know, put a sort of an end to this sort of Suntory Campari relationship because. You don't off you do, you know you wouldn't want to have wild turkey and and the bean portfolio under the same roof, sure. And you you know, and Campari having got into the into the bourbon business, the straight bourbon business, you know, it, it would benefit. You know, obviously, it benefits us to have that focus on on wild turkey rather than getting lost in another. I mean, it's all that sort of high level business. It's way above my pay grade, Jason. So. <laughs> but so, but what in fact in effect happened is that because of the Suntory um, acquisition of Beam, it pulled a lot of those brands. So the Yamazakis, the Hakushis, the Hibikis, the, the Bomors, the Okintoshins, they they were they they now exit the the Campari uh, house, and then a little bit before that, um, Berry Brothers, the who then owed the trademark Glen Rothis decided that their interest lay more of a sort of much smaller craft import in the US. So suddenly we had all these brands and then we were down to really wild turkey. Mm -hmm. This little brand that I managed for a few years called Russell's Reserve, which is, um, you know, has really well over there. And then subsequently the company acquired a blended Canadian whiskey called Forty Creek. So, you know, we're still, you know, mm -hmm. still very much playing in the... Uh, in the whiskey space. Does Campari have any stakes in any American craft producers? No, we don't. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's, you, I mean, Campari, I think, are always looking for opportunities at the, that kind of level, above, again, above my, <laughs> way above my pay, pay station. I mean, and of course it's, <laughs> there have been a, a lot of those smaller, you know, startup distilleries of, caught the eye of a lot of the big players and have been sort of purchased and acquired. We held back. And I think the reason why we've done that is that, you know, we've got a lot to focus on. So, you know, while Turkey's, it's not just a brand, it's an American icon. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's, it's, and the, bourbon, the bourbon category is, is growing beyond these shores. I mean, bourbon is really getting a bit of a run in, in, in Germany, Poland, the United Kingdom, I mean, across Asia. Um, and yep. so that's a that's become a, a focus. The other thing is we, when Campari bought Glen Grant Distillery in 2007, the stock was five years old. Um, there was a few parcels of oldest liquid, but very much constrained, very, very allocated. So huh. um, so now that, you know, stock is has, has maturing, and you know we we're able to put out you know 12 15 and 18 next year you know god willing you know 21 and you know, and also there's the um, the small matter of Dennis Malcolm's our master distiller's diamond anniversary he's the longest serving distiller in Scotland and he started 1961 so next year will be his 60th anniversary he started at 15 years old 
I mean, he didn't, he didn't finish high school. He's amazing. I mean, those days it was job, work, or the devil, quite literally. So mm. job came along, you would take it. And it was a good job with a good prospects because, of course, he was an apprentice cooper. And, uh, and there's no end. I mean, there's 40 million barrels in Scotland maturing whiskey. So there's lots of work for coopers. So he started at the age of 15. And his father and his grandfather worked at Glen Grant Distillery too. So quite quite unusual these days that somebody, you know, works in a, in, in the same place for 60 years. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's, that will be another sort of exciting sort of LTO limited offering that we'll put out next year. So, wow. Well, even beyond what you're saying there about 60 years, mm. Joshua and I were very lucky pre One Nation Under Whiskey days, we spent an afternoon at the distillery with Dennis and he just treated us like royalty. It was an, a, an incredible visit. Mm. And he actually showed us, we, we stepped outside his office and he said, do you see that house there that borders the distillery? I was born in that house. And do you see that house over there on the other side that borders the distillery? That's where I live right now. And it's Never. just like, holy macaroni. Yeah. <laughs> like, what a life you're just seeing encapsulated into a singular mm. moment. But what a gentleman he is. Absolutely wonderful. Well, you know, he was, um, he, he received a call uh, how many years ago was it now? Four or five years ago. And it was Buckingham Palace. Wow. Buckingham Palace. Right? <laughs> Who lives in Buckingham Palace? Um, Queenie Windsor. The Queenie. A.K.A. Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth. And um, so it, uh, the Queen's birth, well, it wasn't the Queen calling. It was one of the many, many sort of aides to the Queen. Um, <laughs> she's, she's quite a big employer. Um, and... But the Queen has her birthday honours list. And right at the very top, um, you know, there's a whole sort of hierarchy of honours in the UK. I mean, we're a very traditional, you know, union of kingdoms, union of countries. Um, at right at the very top is like, you know, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the Queen and royalty. Then, then you become a Sir, you know, Elton John, his contribution to, to Britain and stuff. But then you have this sort of other sort of tier, and the, at the top of that is the uh, officer of um, the Brit Order of the Officer of the British Empire, and then you have the member of the British Empire, and then you have a commander of the British Empire, C OBE, MBE, and then CBE, and the CBE is only military people, but the OBE o o o o is um, is the highest of those, and it was for Dennis's contribution to the Scotch whiskey industry, but also his, he's a community leader. And what mm. I mean by that is he's, he's the, um, on the board of the local schools. So he, he does a lot of tours, actually. The kids, they, they come to, well, when I say to, they don't go, we keep them away from the distillery, of course, but behind the, you, <laughs> you guys went there, you probably saw the Victorian garden um, behind the distillery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Toward that did. garden... That garden has been in existence since Victorian times. I mean, Major James Grant would take cuttings of very rare plant species, non-native species, bring them back, propagate them in the green, there lots, of, lots of green. They were growing melons, pineapples, mangoes wow. in, in Rothes, in these greenhouses, <laughs> in a, in a weather-beaten part of the world. Anyway, so... You go to the gardens now, it's tiger lilies, rhododendrons. I mean, beautiful. I mean, a summer's day, spring day. I mean, Glen Grant Gardens, beautiful. Anyway, so he brings the kids there. They do their sort of paper, you know, treasure hunts. They learn about nature, okay, the importance of nature. Because, of course, we rely, particularly in the distilling industry, we, we absolutely depend on rainfall. You know, when, you know, the River Spey up to 22 degrees. It, there was a drought a couple of years ago. We were praying for rain. We're only the 0.1% of the Scottish population that prays for rain. Everybody hates rain. You can't stand the weather in Scotland. So, anyway, so he, he's got a big influence on, 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 the, on the kind of nurturing these kids and teaching them all about stuff. He's also an elder of the Church of Scotland. So he, spe he spends a lot of time speaking to old ladies. And he is a magistrate, or a, a we call in Scotland a 
JP or JP, Justice of the Peace. So okay. he decides you know, hmm. if young crazy loons, because that's the name for a laddie, a loon, a lunatic, <laughs> decides on how long they're going to go down for or not. Uh-huh. So, oh, so he, all of these things combined, that kind of it hit the radar and he went, went down to, to Buckingham Palace and he was ordered the OBE, something he doesn't like talking about because he's a very modest guy. Yeah. Just like all these guys, really. Yeah. Well, and to show the type of ambassador that he is, he was showing us the visitor center. I think it had just been refurbed in some way. And he said his idea had been to have communal tables mm-hmm. with, you know, sunken areas in the middle where they would just open bottles of Glen Grant, put them into these kind of sunken oh, yeah. zones. Mm-hmm. And as somebody came back from a tour, they would just pick up an open bottle, pour it into a glass, you know, cheers everybody mm-hmm. and, and take a drink from it. And to his mind was if you treated people as if they were in your home, they would be respectful of being in your home. And he said, I don't think anybody will binge drink or take advantage of an open bottle. Um, he then went on to say... And then the Campari sales team from safety. the US came. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, he, he said local health and safety would not allow his plan to be enacted yeah. because you cannot entrust open bottles no. to people. And he thought it just flew in the face of yeah. hospitality. And I, and I thought that spoke volumes about the type of person he is and the type of host that yeah. he is, that he was just willing to trust people. Oh, yeah, no, he's, he's definitely, you know, he, he's, he's got the energy of a... An eighteen-year-old Dennis. I mean, you're literally running after him. Right? Yeah, hundred percent. We really did, didn't yes, we? Josh? Oh yeah. <laughs> and he's always cracking jokes, and he's he's. I mean, he's a he's a religious man, and he's he's uh, dedicated to what he does. I mean, he's his philosophy. I mean, you see this with Jimmy Russell as well. I mean, he's you know, Wild Turkey, hmm. and you guys have oh, done. Oh yeah, what a Well, you guys have, have done a, a couple of bottlings now of Wild Turkey, uh, and you got you guys have got a good nose because every bottling that you've put out there has been exceptional i mean five and a five thank you Uh, five and a five so um but these are the next two oh these were selected last week oh you had a good time down there oh it was brilliant i saw i saw some it was and of course you you have bruce coming in now which makes it even more special and that tension between you know just like a typical family they're so real but um you mentioned the uh you know um hygiene safety i mean you know we're it's very tough, you know, it's tougher and tougher every year, you know, working, because there's so many sort of, you know, you're always getting told what you can't do. I mean, the SEPA is a big, uh, a big one, and the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've got to meet certain very rigorous um, environmental standards. So, for example, we take water out of the river, okay? And, um, you know, the flow in winter is very, you know, very cold. So we have to sort of warm it up. Then we put it through our uh, condensers, okay? So our condensers are running, you know, obviously much, much, uh, well, they, t- they, they turn that cold water into very, very hot water, mm-hmm. okay? We can't simply put that hot water back into the river because then it would upset the balance of nature in, in the river. You know, we have sure. you know, salmon coming upstream, spawning, et cetera. I mean, people pay, you know, a, a king's ransom. I mean, I mean, if you're a VIP at Macallan, you'll probably get, you know, a nice sort of um, part of the river to fish on, you know, uh, with a, you know, I tell you, I mean, rich Russians and rich Asians and rich Americans and people will, will pay, you know, th- hundreds and, th- I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. So, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, that we're making sure that we hit all of these sort of very rigorous standards and, um, mm. you know, taking out, we're putting back in again, you know, so... Um, there's another thing, actually. Um, there's there was a, a very um, rare species of bat that um, decided to make its home at Glen Grant, one of the one of the buildings, and um, so one of the uh, ministries in London um, that oversees, you know, environmental, you know, the endangered species. That's that's call it. Sent up some guy. We had to pay for it. You know, sent this guy out from London. 
and we had to build a little home for it. And um, and so this bat lives in this little home that we built. And then every year, this guy has to come up from London and you know, inspect it, make make a report, make sure that we're making sure that we're ensuring this bat. Uh, I'm, you know, you can understand why you would do it. But I mean, I'm just what I'm trying to say is that you know, there's so many things going on that we had to adhere to, like your you know, Dennis' mm-hmm. idea. Of, of course, mm-hmm. you can't have people free pouring these days. Maybe maybe back in the early nineties. Mm. <laughs> taking <laughs> taking generous samples and tasks. <laughs> uh, so I, I interrupt you. I threw you off your your uh, thread there. You're about to talk about working with Jimmy Russell. Tell us more about that, because I think you're in an in an incredible position, where you've got Dennis Malcolm on one side of the Atlantic, and Jimmy Russell, and of course Eddie Russell, on the other yeah. side of the Atlantic. Oh, What's that like? That, that's that's remarkable to me. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, because, I mean, Jimmy's now, I think, 66 years. I mean, Jimmy... Mm, mm-hmm. it, yeah, yeah, I think it was yeah, last Jimmy week, started, was it I mean, think about it. Jimmy started before man landed on the moon, okay? Wow. Before the colored televisions, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, wow. Pontius was still a pilot. God was still... <laughs> um, I mean, and Dennis, I mean, albeit Dennis started a little bit later. I mean, Dennis started in 1961. I mean, that's next year, like I said, it's 60 years ago. So there's a there's a there's a an invisible bond that brings these two men together. And it's the right way of doing things. And it's a, an adherence to the sort of old methods. You know, I I've, as a, as a brand manager of both of those brands, you know, there would be a, you know, you would, you would pitch your idea to the master stiller and Jimmy wouldn't even have to say anything. He knew what the answer would be. If he was like that, he didn't, yeah. he didn't like the idea. <laughs> if it was, eh, you liked it. You didn't, I mean, and it's pretty much the same with Dennis. And what they focus on is, is, you know, it's really about the flavor. It's really about the balance. I mean, Dennis would say it's the harmony of the nose, the palate and the finish. I mean, a lot is put into the spirit itself. I mean, you know, with the, you know, back to Jimmy, I mean, like maybe not doing things the, uh, the most economically, um, you know, uh, see best interest economically, but doing the things the right way. I mean, we don't have to distill at 130 proof. We could go up to 160, or Jimmy could go up to 100, Eddie and the team. But 130 is, is the cut because the lower the proof, the more you, you will get in flavor. The higher you sure. distill, of course, you're going to burn off a lot of that flavor. I mean, the, the non-GMO, um, the timber rick houses, I mean, you know, we don't have sort of, I mean, we have a couple of palletized warehouses because we've had to, because, you know, the bourbon boom in the in the last 10 mm. years, you know, we, everyone has had to expand production and expand warehousing. But, you know, we have um, timber rick houses at um, Wild Turkey. And that, again, that's, the, they've done the old, everything's bottled at Wild Turkey, like it is yeah. at Glen. So no corners are cut and, you know, traditional methods are adhered to. Yes, we are innovating, we're putting product to market, but, you know, it's essential that you, you know, you don't cut corners and, and you, I mean, you would, they would say, look, we're doing this for the next generation and ensuring that those, you know, at, Gle- at, at Wild Turkey, you've got Eddie now as master distiller, you know, and in, in time, Bruce and his cousin, Joanne, you know, we hope that one day that they'll, you know, take the reins so that mm-hmm. can be, you know, passed on to the next generation and the next generation beyond that. So I think that's very, I think that's core to Dennis and Jimmy. It's, uh, yeah. as it should be, I think. And so just, just to close this out for me, final question, Josh, and then I'll give you the floor. Is there something within Campari's ethos that they know to, to step back give these two situations room to breathe. They're, they're not 
pounding down the door to get their own people in to put their own stamp on it. They, they seem aware of what they have and they're, they're letting mm. it breathe. Is that what you're seeing as somebody who's inside the company? I'm obviously outside the company observing this. Is that an ethos that carries? Yeah, no. The I mean, that's a good point, Jason. I mean, Campari itself. I mean, Campari, the brand is is an old, old brand with old, old traditions from Italy. I mean, mm. Campari grew out of the Italian aperitivi movement. I mean, you know, there's you 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 would have you know ancient history coming into it from the you know the monasteries that make the amaros, those elixirs that you know potion. Yeah. The, the alchemists, as it were, that, you know, were also traveling through the islands, um, you know, making alcohol and imbibing it and getting close to God and all of that. So, you know, the Campari, um, you know, Campari has, has you know, it's, it feels like it, the Campari has taken the world by storm a little bit, you know, acquiring mm -hmm. um, brands outside the sort of Italian aperitivo maro category so you know sky vodka got itself a footprint into the u.s because i mean the u.s is i think the biggest uh, most valuable market in the world so it's vital to to if you're going to play in the u.s you you have to build your own sort of platform so sure. to build from grassroots up very very difficult very takes a lot of time very expensive so the the probably the the best model to get it into the market route to market is to buy an already established business. Sky Vodka is already established. It's a 2.5 million case vodka brand in the US, born in San Francisco. Actually founded by someone very similar to Gaspari Campari, you know, an eccentric nutcase that comes up with this magic elixir, which becomes a, you know, a trademark, a global icon. Well, Morris Cambo is, that guy in California he was an inventor and he, you know, he, he sort of created Sky Vodka, you know, a, a unique distillation process. I think it was distilled four times, one of the first that go through extra, extra distillation. Very distinct packaging, you know, the blue mm -hmm. bottle mm -hmm. time. So anyway, so that's mm -hmm. kind of, that, that's an example of how Campari has sort of got, got into that, those markets by buying it. But I think in terms of, many of Campari's acquisitions, what it's done is that it's ensured that the, the, um, the vertical process is all under one roof. So the distilling, the maturing, warehousing, all that, and then the bottling. So everywhere we have a, everywhere, everywhere we have a <coughs> whether it be Appleton Rum, whether it be Jalisco, uh, San Nicolas, where Espelon is made, Glen Grant in Scotland, Wild Turkey in Kentucky, we not only distill it, mature it, package it, um, well, we bottle it and package it. So we can, you know, oversee. So, you know, the supply chain is a big thing with Campari. And also I think that gives um, that gives us consumers confidence that, you know, we're doing it under our own supervision. And, and the whole thing, the whole process is integrated into one. So that's also a very strong Campari thing. But I think more to your point, Jason, is that I've worked for other companies where you've had, they've sent people and they've, they've got involved and they've changed stuff around. What's great about Campari is they've kept back and they've allowed the Jimmys and the Eddies and the Dennises and the yeah. George on with the, 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 the business of making the product in the way it should be made. So there's, no, there's no questions about, oh, how do we cut costs? Can we, can we move to a cheaper corn or can we, we, can we buy cheaper barrels? It's, that's not really, these conversations mm -hmm. really happen. And I know because, you know, I work in the global team and, um, you know, we're, we're really at, you know, working hand in hand with the distilleries themselves. So, you know, we, we, there's no sort of bean counters getting involved, which is, which is a good thing. <laughs> awesome. So, Throughout this entire conversation, what what I've been hearing from you is that you've been either in charge of or part of the team to to launch brands, to maybe redesign packaging, relaunch brands within different markets, and and telling that brand story, why it's important, why 
why Dennis Malcolm is important, why Eddie Russell is important, and Jimmy and and, and all that. So I'm curious, mm-hmm. from your perspective, I wonder if you could take, I'm going to back it up a little bit. I wonder if you could take our listeners through the step-by-step process of actually launching and or reintroducing a brand into a market. You know, take mm-hmm. Glenn Grant, for instance, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's gone through packaging changes. It's likely gone through some recipe changes and things mm-hmm. like that. I remember just a few years ago, the whole Grant, uh, Glenn Grant line changed new bottles and new age mm-hmm. statements. Like, so what does that look like when you're relaunching a brand? How, what's the thought process? How yeah. do you get the word out there? Yeah, and so no, that's a good question. I mean, it's a great question, uh, Josh. And, you know, uh, people who are in the know will have seen, you know, quite a few packaging changes, particularly, uh, you know, with the, the aforementioned brands that you just said. And I think, you know, let's take a step back because the, the landscape's changing all the time, you know. Hmm. And we've, you know, have a millennial sort of consumer coming through and then a Gen a Gen Z consumer now coming of age. So the marketing people were sort of looking at, you know, customer uh, consumer trends and, you know, consumer tastes and, uh, you know, see if there's any patterns and... Um, and we're always, you know, keeping the pulse of the consumer because really it's, you know, the consumer is that link in the chain. Without the consumer, we've got nothing. Everything falls right. apart. So, yep. sure. so as marketers, we, we look at that. And then we will sort of listen to consumers and, and we'll do research. Sometimes we'll do research and just to make sure that, you know, what we're communicating is so relevant and all that. And at some point we'll take a sort of view whether do we need to up date do we need to refresh do we need to sort of keep up with the times you know do we uh, do we look too sort of recessive do we i mean mm-hmm. now the explosion of brands do we stand out you know um, on the shelf i mean i'll tell you right now you know we this will be fading away soon and we'll bring, be bringing the new pack it's the same bottle the same formula you know mm-hmm. we're just making this area just a little bit more stand out. But uh, so okay. I, I can give you an example, which I was um, involved in um, and I led was, was the Russell's Reserve pack. And um, the um, <clears throat> Russell's Reserve had, when, when, Glenn, when, when um, Campari had acquired Wild Turkey, American Honey and Russell's Reserve came with it. So you buy the distillery, you, you, you inherit, you know, the, the labor force, all the stock, all the trademarks. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, that's all now yours. So we had a little brand called Russell's Reserve, which was, you know, a cute little bottle and it had a little thin strip of a label and it had Russell's Reserve. You know, you remember that? Oh, it yeah. Was I've got silk, plenty of bottles. <laughs> silk, silk screened onto the shoulder of the bottle. And the, the liquor is amazing because it was a 10 years old straight bourbon. And it was a six years old straight rye. So really, you're talking about the oldest, probably the arguably the most precious liquid at Wild Turkey went into Russell's Reserve. Yeah. But then it, you know, it kind of disappeared on the back bar. You would like, you would okay. I see Jack. I see Woodford. I see Knob Creek. Oh, oh, oh there, oh there, Russell's. It was. You couldn't really see it. I mean, it was just kind of. Oh. So okay, the thought so was. It, yeah. Go on. Sorry. So, so what you so so what you then do is you then sort of the next year you sort of go to management and you say look, yeah, we we think that this brand needs a facelift. We need you know it needs to stand out more. It needs to grab the attention of the consumer to draw them in to pick up the ball. We need to make it storied, you know. So what we do then is we sort of pitch it out to agencies. We, you know, and then we find an agency that we really like, and then they. They'll we'll, we'll we'll give them a brief, you know. We'll yeah. say this is Russell's. This is what it means. This is what the brand's all about. This is what it stands for. These is the consumers that. There you go. That's yep, it. There's the picture. That was the Thank first you, single Jason. barrel. That was yeah. the first single barrel which we brought out in about 2011 or something. But anyway, 
So we'll we'll kind of feed all that information. We'll sort of take that agency, the creative guy, the you know account manager, the team. We'll probably take them down to the distillery. We'll sort of put them up in. Well, we put them up in the. Uh, gosh, what what was the hotel where the invent? You know, the Brown Hotel where they invented the hot brown. You know that <laughs> that famous Kentucky uh, breakfast delicacy. Yeah, you could die of a heart attack if you eat it every day. But anyway. Um, so we really immerse them in the brand and that's really what inspires the creative process. So what they do is they came back with, you know, some some sort of designs and we said, well, we like this and we like that. We don't like this, we don't like that. But eventually it became that, which yeah. was what we see today, which which is the sort of Russell's Reserve on the white label. So it's very striking. So, the yeah. 10 years old age statement pops because we know that consumers... And there's a wee story about you know, Jimmy and Eddie being the, you know, combined, you know, 100 years or whatever. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, Timber Rick Cows is number four alligator char. It's all there. Uh, and, you know, you start getting noticed. So okay. that's what you, that's what you kind of, that, I think that's what drives it's It's that kind of visibility. Of so it's it, the, the redesign or relaunches are all in an effort to capture the eye of that cons- that new consumer, that new customer that may have missed you previously. Yeah, ultimately, of course it is. I mean, you want Pat to, to stand out and, um, you know, so not all brands seek to do that, um, but you're also wanting to convey what the brand's all about, what the brand's meaning is. What you want to do is you want to encapsulate on the label, on the packaging, mm-hmm. where the copy, the type, the essence of that, what that brand is, what that brand is all about. Okay, mm-hmm. it's it, 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 it's it's the identity. It's the key. It's seventy five percent of the marketing. It's the pack that sits on the bar or on the shelf of the store. Sure. So, it, in a sense, it. You know, some some packs, some some brands are kind of have become ethereal. I mean, you think about, you know, Jack Daniels. That Jack Daniels pack is so I- iconic. I mean, Lafroig, Lafroig is right. in, in the U.S. It's a very iconic brand in the single malt category, and it took them many many years to change that. But they've slightly tinkered with it. I mean, look at um, look at you know uh, Maker's Mark. I mean, they'll never get rid of that sort of wax mm-hmm. top. I mean, that is of course. That yeah. part of the DNA of the brand. So, but then it's, you know, you know, hindsight is great. I mean, you know, this, this sort of packaging and or, 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 packaging has always been very, very important. But, you know, there's a whole kind of science and process behind it. Mm. And whether it's to convey your story or get a little bit of standout or, you know, in our category, that you know, it's the expressions that billboard effect. You know, <clears throat> right? It, label the green label, the black label. You know. Would marketing and brand management also drive potentially new recipes or uh, a few weeks of running peated malt when when a distillery hadn't run peated malt to try to capture other markets, mm. or does that come from? the production end of things? I think I know the answer to it, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Well, it's always evolving, Josh. I mean, um, you know, where you know, we will do it both ways. We'll, we'll, we'll do the sort of brainstorm workshop, as it were, because we'll, we'll need people in the room who have the finger on the pulse. <clears throat> you know, we'll, a lot of work will be done to prep. You know, there'll be a whole, you know, let's say, they call a deep dive on the category. You know, um, so that will drive kind of a lot of the, um, you know, the, the look, the decoration on the label, on the bottle, what the bottle mm-hmm. looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the innovation idea comes from the actual, the biggest asset of all, which is, of course, your stock, your maturing stock. So, like you mentioned, the people, uh, yeah. let's say, I mean, I mean, I'm just making this up. You know, we get a delivery of barley, which we don't check. And it's, it's the wrong barley. It's peated and we process it. And, and when it's in the mash, we realize, well, hang on. So, but it's too late to stop. You know, 10 years later, that might, what are we going to do with this? The distillery manager will say to the market, what, what are we going to do with this? I mean, 
I can't just teaspoon this into, you know, my my core range. I mean, that will <laughs> yeah, take exactly. forever. I mean, and then that that will get the creative juices thinking, you know. So, you know, you'd like to think um, that you know the the people at the distillery, you know, who are, you know, um, evaluating the stock all the time, know where everything is. You know, they're mm-hmm. having a lot of that liquid innovation. You know, I mean, we have um, at Campari, we, we have uh, people who are specialised, you know, chemists who um, are very, whose job it is to, you know, analyse, identify and create, you know, different blends, different flavour profiles. So, I mean, I was speaking to um, Joy Spence this morning and um, she's the master blend at Appleton Estate. Um, and she's had uh, this idea for a while, and it's now finally come to fruition. And it's a great idea because all the all the um, um, offerings from Appleton are blends, so they're blends of different marks of rum. So at Appleton, yeah. mm-hmm. pot stills, and we have columns, right? And we have different re- yeast times. So we have one strain of yeast, okay, but we'll have different periods of of fermentation so running that through a pot still or running through that column still where you can take different cuts gives you many many different unique marks of rum of course they're all blended together to create you know your eight years old your 12 years old your whatever it is but joy's idea was to actually bottle some of those single mark that come through only the pot stills and of course Uh pot stills are, are it's the old style of distilling. It's it's a batch stop start process, where you know you're getting you're going to get a lot more sort of heart and soul of the spirit. Mm. So so she's producing, she's launching a single mark, um, single pot still, vintage rum for three from three vintages, so 1994, 1995, and 1999. So they're all they're small parcels of barrel, single malt, not blends. So it's it's kind of getting rum into that sort of sphere of single malt scotch, and that's where I think you know. I think that's you know a big thing now is that people who are into whiskey. I mean, I remember people you you were into scotch, you were into bourbon, and sometimes never never the twain would meet. But then scotch whiskey start talking about the bourbon barrels they're mm-hmm. using, and that you know invited a. Few bourbon drinkers into scotch, and and um, and then now you know the borders are so blurry now. Yeah, people are going yeah. to Albanyak. Everybody's trying and, everything. I mean, Raj Bak has you know has, has, he's gone into Almanyak. He's thinking he's telling people that he's going to take whiskey drinkers in. I think rum is going to be a, a frontier where perhaps you're already dabbling in yourselves right now, guys. I mean, you're probably speaking to the same customer. Yep. To, We'll, we'll, we'll dabble back and forth. I mean, it's just that sure. people know more. People, the thing is, the difference now is people have iPhones. You know, they have smartphones. They can get information. <laughs> they, they're, they're, and, they're, and there's this fast-tracking trend, fast-tracking, almost to become an expert, you know. Yeah, sure. And we're feeding that because we're putting For all these stories in the labels. We're inviting people to the distilleries. We're putting all these big... You know, experiential tasting. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the people we speak to can sometimes sniff out some of the marketing. Yes, of course. But by and large, I mean, um, you know, we're winning hearts and minds, hands and mouths. Facts tell, stories sell, if you like. That's that's how marketing is, has become, I think. You know. Cheers. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, I... I know we have a question that that we always ask that we want to get out of here on, but but Jason, if there was another question that was percolating in your brain, so I was going to say I do have a question if my internet will allow me to ask it, <laughs> and my my internet has totally gone in the toilet. One of my absolute favorite things I had the chance to drink it when I was in Italy a few years ago for my brother's birthday is Glen Grant five year old. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right, Jason. You and I Can you... had our fair share of that. Yes, at the wedding. Yes, we pounded that bottle over a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did. Can you speak to how Italy got an age statement that said five at a time when the whiskey world thought 
whiskey began at least at eight and probably at... Well, actually, it was long before that, Chase. Long before that. I mean, you know, Glen Grant was one of the first, one of the only single malts out there in the market. And that was really the, uh, I think, the uh, sort of late 1960s. And it was a gentleman called Armando Giovanetti. He was an Italian businessman. He came to Scotland looking for a Scotch whisky that would be palatable for the Italian drinker, whose only distilled spirit was grappa. Uh, and, okay, mm. all right. There so, we go. starting to make a connection <laughs> here. Uh-huh. Go on. So, um, I mean, this, I, I'm sure there's several ways that you can skin a cat and tell this story, but um, he, uh, he, I believe that Armando, and he's still around. He's he's, he's on Facebook, but he he he. Um, he went round Scotland looking for, you know, a light and fruity, malty Scotch whiskey that, you know, that would be loved back home. And uh, and he discovered Glen Grant and he obviously got, you know, fair time in the warehouse because he must have looked through lots and lots of barrels. But he felt like Glen Grant, because, mm-hmm. because we produce such a floral, aromatic, very f- refined spirit. I mean, McCann talk to you all day long about their sure. wood policy and they have a master of wood but what our absolute north star is is the spirit and you know the the uh, those tall stills and purifiers and every still was a way to really create a just a just a it's like it's kind of like fine-tuning a you know rolls royce or a spitfire that's the kind of craftsmanship um nice but he fell in love and, and you know, and that spirit, it, it kind of takes on a lot of character, you know, quite young. And so he thought five years old makes sense. They weren't, they weren't shackled by age, the Italians. They weren't really a Scotch drinking, they're not really, a, they weren't really a Scotch drinking uh, pop, uh, country. So he brought over, they said he had connections with the mafia, but he managed to get Glen Grant everywhere. Um, and other whiskies that tried to get into the Italian market, namely Macallan, they came out with a six years old, which they introduced to the Italian market, trying to steal away uh, and grant share. Yeah. Ah. If I always Ours is remarkable. one year older. <laughs> I always find it remarkable, actually. You, you'll go to Italian restaurants, you know, in America, that are Italian-owned restaurants. So the family will have come over from Italy. And the guy that owned Mario, let's say, will have, you'll always see Glenn Grant on the, on the back bar in the most... Because sure. that's you know it's, it's the Scotch brand initially, but but yeah, so that's why you know um, Campar- Glen Grant was um, it was the Seagram Bronfman family from Canada. Uh, okay, yeah, I Samuel okay. Bronfman. And he was he was a very very smart businessman, Samuel Bronfman, and he bought Shivers Brothers, and Glen Grant was part of Shivers Brothers. It was actually the Glen Grant Glen Livet. Uh, distillery company then bought by uh, an English brewer then the Japanese Suntory had a share in Glen Grant at some point in time and then Shivers bought it and then when Shivers becomes part of Perno um, Perno buys Absolute Vodka 16 billion US dollars I mean a crazy price but then the banks start wanting money back and uh, so Perno is now <laughs> selling some of its not what they call its non-core brands. So Glen Grant was a distiller of these soul, but it, it remained a one of the um, key uh, malts in in Shivas. I mean, I think they're probably changing it over time, but certainly it was a very much it was it was known as a, a, a an A one top dressing malt whiskey Glen Grant. So if you if you pick up an old bottle of Shivers, I mean, even a bottle of Shivers now, knows it and then knows Glen Grant, you'll get very fruity, multi characteristics. If you think about it, Shivers represents Speyside, the lighter style. Ballantines represents more of that chunkier style. Johnny Walker represents more of the Isla style. And really, Glen Grant was the, the top dresser. I think, I think they've changed it now, but. That Cheers. Makes good sense. Yeah, I, that makes I love good it. Sense. I love the fact they carried the five. I love the fact they represented a country. And yeah, as Joshua and I say, we pounded yeah. it easy. 
And even as as we've talked today, I've got the Major's Reserve next to me, which is a, a British bottling uh, of Glen Grant, which must be around five, six, seven well, years old. Is, so is Major's, Major's Reserve, Reserve old was, is the five years old. They call it five years old in Italy. Um, but now here's the thing, here's the thing. I mean, this Good. is where whiskey nomics come in. And you guys, you know this um, very, very well, that um, what we've seen is the prices go upwards. And we've seen many brands, you know, get out of that volume business, that lower priced volume business. But that's what got Campari into the Scottish business because it saw that volume. So over years, you have to sort of, you have to adjust. And, and we talked about the changing landscape. You see a lot of brands that have, you know, gone into that premium, super premium, luxury, prestige, and prices have got high. We're at the stage now, we're kind of joining that. Um, so we've started to restrict um, the five years old majors. We actually killed it in the US. Uh, we, we're, yeah. killing, we're cutting mm-hmm. it back. We're only keeping it in a couple of markets, but Italy where it's actually part of the Italian culture. We can't really mess with it in Italy. Maybe a couple of, yeah. in France, perhaps. Um, that, that, I mean, you know France is a big volume, low price Scotch whiskey market. Yes. So, you know, yep. we play in that market as well. But elsewhere, we really want to focus on the 10 years old, which we don't ha- actually have in North America. We, ha- we we only sell at 12 because Americans associate, you know, that 12 as the magic number. But sure. elsewhere, we do a 10, mm-hmm. 12 in some markets, 15, which the, the big challenge we have is that we're about one-tenth of the size of a couple of our neighbors who are big, big brands. Um, I'm not going to mention the names you probably guess i mean the the truth is i mean a lot of the big five you know a lot of the big five top brands in the single malt category in recent years have gone through big expansion i mean they've gone literally from you know 10 stills to 40 stills or to 50 stills from 20 warehouses to holding you know 200,000 barrels to a million barrels i mean massive massive expansion so that's great because you, you, you're you building stock for the future. You know, you're going to sell more of it. India, China, you're starting to wake up to, you know, the marvels, the wonders of single malt Scotch. Mm. But for us, we're, we're, we're about a tenth of the size. And because we've, we've had to mature our whiskey, we're only really producing and, and offering out, you know, what we have. And, uh, and it's very, very precious. So sometimes we run up, we run out of liquid. Sometimes we just don't have enough liquid to supply, you know, uh, <laughs> most of the liquor stores that, you know, the, li- the, the real whiskey heads are going to. But what I would say is, you know, and, 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 and I agree, not everybody, the good thing is, Jason, everyone's palate is unique. If, if they were all like yours or they were all like mine, there would only be one brand. There would only be one whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the great yeah. thing is that we're all different. Exactly. So, and that's the wonderful thing about whiskey. There's so much choice. But I would say to your, you know, sometimes we, we get people see us, oh, yeah, Glen Grant, they're owned by an Italian company. It's five years old. That's all they care about. No, we don't. We want people to try this. Go out and try this. Knows it. You know, it's just that malt, not a malt molecule out of place. I mean, it's just you really get the mm. house style that, that comes through in all of the offerings. I mean, this 12, we use a bit of sherry, we use bourbon. The 15 is 100% first fill bourbon. It's non-chill filtered. It's bottled at 100 proof. The 18 years old is refilled bourbon. It just has that lovely kind of butter scotch, you know, these yeah. malt yeah. notes. But try it, you know, be open-minded. I mean, we don't have a lot of money to spend. I mean, we're, we're, we're poor compared with some of the big brands that lots of advertising power, but... I guess it's a journey and it's a great journey of discovery. So try it. Yeah, that's spot on advice. We certainly do our part to to spread the good word of Glen Grant. Yes, you do, Turkey. guys, and we appreciate it. You know, big fans. Jason, did you want to deliver our closing question? Robin, we always get out of here very simply by asking our guest, what's the thing, the next thing coming up for you that you're most excited about? Well, um, apart from my succulent garden and my retainers in my front yard, <laughs> so I live on the side of a hill, um, I think it's, you know, this has been a really tough year. You know, COVID has been, I mean, it's scuppered plans. I mean, we're, we're celebrating 180 years 
uh, since the distillery was founded. So we had plans to put out a um, you know a limited edition, but you know the, the, this this annoying um, inconvenient pestilence has really kicked that into touch. But we're looking forward to bringing out something really really special um, to celebrate Scotland's longest serving distiller. Uh, Dennis Malcolm OBE. It'll be something really special, guys. Top, top, top draw. Um, it will be soup to nuts, packaging, liquid, story. I mean, it will be a blockbuster. It will be likely um, how many bottles are available. It will be very low. It will be available globally. I mean, it will, it's really going to be something for, you know, collectors, I think. Um, beyond that, you know, it's filling out our range. I mean, we don't have a 21, but we will do. We don't have a 25. We probably will have one of those in years to come. Maybe a 30, and that's C. I mean, um, that's the great thing about mm -hmm. having, you know, warehouses full of maturing barrels. They're all like people. They're all, you know, changing and developing at their own pace. So um, we, go, we want to do it the right way at Glen Grant. We don't want to sort of, you know, cut corners. You know, we want to do it the right way. And we've got a good team. We've got great team experience in our marketing team. You know, we've got, um, you know, through our Campari networks, you know, we will get to those consumers eventually. And, and when they find us, they will be, you know, pleasantly surprised, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I, I wanted to ask you guys, I mean, what's the next big thing coming down for you guys? Because I'll tell you something. I'm taking my hat off to you because... You, you're you're two passionate guys, and you've I mean your relationships. I mean you're a you know you're a Laurel and Hardy kind of act in a, in, a, in not in a negative way, but you're, you're <laughs> guys. you've got great following and you've done some really cool stuff and and Thank you. and you've built up this incredible space within the whiskey. I mean people go you're go to guys for whiskey knowledge and stuff, and, and you're very very well connected. Things are going well for you. I mean what's next? You know, for you guys, what's what can we sort of look forward to? Wow, from Wild Turkey. <laughs> wow, we, we've got well, a few things some... actually. I, I can think uh, of one thing, Jason. Um, was it? I, I can think of a big thing. Um, m mine is mine is turning back to what I showed yes. you earlier, which is we've got our two chosen samples from our early September trip to the distillery uh, mm -hmm. in Kentucky. Uh, our wild yeah. turkey picks that were magnificent, really magnificent. So obviously very excited yeah. to get those out yeah. in due course. Uh, and Joshua, what's, what's the one you're identifying? Well, we've, we've been teasing this a little bit to our listeners and to, you know, to members of and customers of Single Cast Nation, but no one's ever seen this, uh, but you're going to see this for the first time. Uh, we are, as of 2021, and, and I think this is perfect because we're talking to a brand manager. Our, our not a brand manager packaging. anymore. Not anymore. Oh, right. Oh, what's your, okay. what's your, what's your official title? <laughs> oh, gosh, I've got one of these crazy titles. Global Whiskey Advocate. All right. And that's whiskey yes. with the parentheses around the E, so it encapsulates American whiskey, Canadian oh, look and that. Scotch whiskey. If it doesn't have, if the country of origin doesn't have an E in the spelling, whiskey spelt without an E. Yeah. So this is a new packaging. And so just like you were talking about with, with the Glen Grant up top, and you said, oh, you know, it's kind of difficult to see on a back bar. We wanted this to be very visible on a back bar because up until today, this part yeah. was clear. Yeah. Right. So now you have that, and we have a whole new uh, label. Foot system. label. Mm hmm And, uh, and this is something we've been telling. We're, we're done with corks. Oh. We're going screw top. Why, why, why is that? Well, with corks, you, you always have corks that fail. Or I've, we've had cork to whiskey. And then mm -hmm. when you switch to synthetic, then you're dealing with, well, synthetic cork doesn't expand or contract depending on heat or cold. And so you can get leakage during shipping. Yeah. And that's a pain in the butt. And we just said, you know what? Let's let's go screw top. No one no one else is doing screw top. Let's let's give it a go. And so we are. So screw your cork. 
Screw your cork. That's what I say. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so yeah. So that that's that's what we have, and hopefully, it will give our packaging a slightly more serious look. Yeah. And you know, take us to where we need to go. We we launched in UK Europe in 2019, and you know, I think we're fairly established here in the U.S. There's always room to grow, but it's how how do we capture the notice of customers outside of the U.S. And so this yeah. is just part of our plan to do that. I think I think you know you have a, a unique opportunity is because all every relationship that you have through throughout the supply chain, the route to market, and all the way through you know the uh, distributor, the salespeople, the the trade and the consumer. So you, you've got that, you know, every touch point. And you can do things that, you know, a lot of the big guys can't do. And I, I think you don't have the distractions of having a vodka or a rum or a tequila. Mm. And lots and lots of different, you know, brands going with all sorts of different objectives. You can focus absolutely on what you do. And, and, I, and, you know, people love you guys. People love dealing with you. I'm really, really proud of what you you guys have achieved because you've really done a great job. Well done. Well, thank you. But but it's also good people like yourself. Like you have done a remarkable job of fighting our corner within Campari. You know, without you, I'm not sure, and, and I don't think Joshua is sure, that we would even bottle a wild turkey. You came to us with a real plan, with a, you know, you know, the industry's been filling casts for people for for forever, and um, yeah. what they do with it, it's their own business. But you guys came to us and said, "Look, you know, we we actually want to really tell your story and uh, elevate your brand, right. and get to audiences that you might not get to with one hundred and one. Well, you know, Wild Turkey one hundred and one, which uh, you know, yeah, mm. and and that that's really important for us and and. You know, when I started dealing with you, you know, when you came to me and back in those days, I, I, I saw, I saw the the benefit of working with you. Thank you. Cheers. I know it took us a good four plus years to get Robin on the podcast, but I am so glad that we did. Uh, we we saved. Some of the best, not for last, because this podcast is far from over, but uh, Robin, we saved you until we became better podcasters. Well, that's very well put. We will be using that going forward because we are beginning to enter into dangerous territory All right, where Robin's not the first person to say to us, <laughs> oh, finally, like... Mm -hmm. We have we haven't been purposely avoiding anybody. If if you're on the podcast, you're somebody we have wanted on the podcast. Um, yeah, our our Mid Atlantic distributor uh, just reached out the other week to say, mm. any chance you guys could get Bill Thomas on the podcast? And it's like a hundred percent. We've been trying to get Bill Thomas on the podcast for the better part of a year and a half, two years. It just hasn't aligned with schedules. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. And so there there are people who we haven't interviewed who we desperately want to have on. Uh, I'm going to throw a name at you right now. And Ooh, I don't I think I she's going to see this. As, yeah, well, I hope you do too. Otherwise, it's going to end up under a bus. But Rachel Barry. Oh if whenever gosh. we yeah. see Rachel Barry, yeah, we can do the podcast. Yeah, we can make the podcast work. And then it just doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's a reality for why. And I don't mean to be defensive, and I appreciate that I'm being very defensive. <laughs> but I just want people to know that we love them, whether they've been on the podcast yet or not. Yeah, We do still love them. Yeah. Yeah, I want to... Uh, so A, that is 100% true. And B... For our listeners who, for whatever reason, may not have heard the name Bill Thomas before, he is the gentleman who owns Jack Rose Dining Saloon in Washington, D.C., uh, which if you've never been there, uh, maybe when the end of the world is over, you should go there because it's an amazing establishment. And then Rachel Perry, of course, is the, I think, her official... Master 
Blender. It is Master Blender. Okay, Master Blender for Glendronach, Ben Riach, Glen Glassa. What else does she have under her belt? <laughs> I like the. I was enjoying the fact that you were just adding comma after comma. Uh, she's Master Blender at Brown Forman. For Brown Forman, but I think those are the brands that she focuses on. I tried to help you out the cul-de-sac. You locked yourself right back into it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mazel, take yourself uh, off to the East Wing and think about what you've done. Well, yes, I will. So we have <laughs> we have some we have. Do we have any news we want to share? Um, give us the news. I've got something I'm going to say. All right. Asking you shall receive. Extra, extra, we all are body, life, story, a flavor, penny, extra, 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 we all about it. Me and I play for in trouble again. We've talked a lot over recent episodes about releases of of whiskey. And really the the last thing we've we've got that we're we're sitting on is our balconies. And that will be released in October. Mm -hmm. After releasing the Pindarin, after releasing the Whistle Pigs, we're just letting the the shipping chain cool down and then the, the balconies will go out. But in this news segment... Mm -hmm. I want to get a little meta. We have returned to sending out a state of the nation email. Ah, that's which, correct. Which is state of the parentheses, single cask, close parentheses, nation. <laughs> and, and so the reason that I want to bring it up in the news segment of the podcast is the state of the nation addresses the global state of the nation. Ah. And so no matter where you're listening to this podcast, we implore you to become a member of Single Cast Nation. Mm -hmm. Come along to singlecastnation.com, sign up as a member. Free account. And you, perfectly free, you'll give us your email. We'll not spam you. We 100% will never sell it. Never sell it. Never. But it will allow us to stay in contact with you. And so when we release the State of the Nation, we are talking about how Single Cast Nation Online United States is looking. If you live outside of the United States, unfortunately, we cannot ship that whiskey to you. But we are also talking about Single Cast Nation US retail and Single Cast Nation UK, Europe, and rest of the world retail. And we're talking about the podcasts, and we'll be talking about anything else that's going on within the nation. Mm -hmm. And that is now a global nation. So please do, please become a member of Single Cast Nation. I am sorry, we are sorry that we can't ship whiskey outside of the United States but we are working diligently to get very interesting releases going for UK, Europe, rest of the world retail. And we would love for you to be among the first people to learn about those. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Very nice. A good inclusion. I feel so happy that we're, that we've reincarnated the state mm. of the nation. Mm -hmm. email. Indeed. It took a, a pentagram. It took a sacrificed goat. It took me darkening my hair. Um, I, I, I got out yeah. the old spray can, uh, <laughs> jet black, jet, jet black. And we reincarnated the yeah. state of the nation email. Yeah, I, re I remember it just light as a feather, stiff as a board, light as a feather, stiff as a board. It was great. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I was I was there. So once a month, somewhere around the first, unless the first falls on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, around the first of the month, you will see the state of the nation. Good. And it's just another avenue for us to try and put in one place a lot of the things we're up to globally. For example, in this reincarnated state of the nation from October 1, we included the second retail release for UK, Europe, rest of the world. And so just to reiterate there, uh, we've got a 1974 Invergordon, a 1991 Aberfeldy, a 1996 Imperial, a 2010 Glenelgin, and a 2011 Clinlish. 
those are helmed by global sales manager Jess Lomas. Mm -hmm. And so having the chance through the state of the nation to just, boom, put those right in front of people mm -hmm. uh, who either are in those markets or would like to be in a market uh, that sees our products. The other, the other wonderful thing is, and, and this is addressed in the state of the nation, our info at singlecastnation.com email address mm -hmm. is always open. Always. Drop, drop us yep. a note anytime you want. As you receive the state of the nation email, just hit reply on it and you'll, boom, you'll get right back to us mm -hmm. and we'll be able to answer any questions you've got. As easy as that, you don't even need to remember the email address. You'll just be able to hit reply. How's that for a beautiful line of communication? Made it nice and easy, Jason. Nice. That was my goal. Easy. That's yep. absolutely my goal, yep. our goal, everybody's goal. So there you Good. go. I, as you can tell, we're excited about State of the Nation coming back and we're going to make it a very useful monthly email blast. Good, good. I would like to move over to listener emails slash listener questions, if you wouldn't mind. And actually, well, we've been receiving a lot of emails as of late. Some of them we're going to slate for the next episode of Extra Extra, It's All About Whiskey. But we had one question come in that I actually put in front of Robin Cooper that I think we should get to. And then we had an email come in from a good nation member, good listener as well, Dan Grison. And so I ask you, yep, Jason. Very good lad. I ask you, Jason, what should we lead with? Let's lead with Robin. Okay, good. So I'm going to move it back over to the tape and we'll hear what that question is and what Robin's answer is in kind. I, I, ha I have one quick question for you. And you may or may not know this, but when you talked about working with, you know, 57 different bottling lines and, and products and such like that, we had a question come in. I was doing a tasting. And so a guy by the name of Zach Abdul, he asked me a very specific question that I think is specifically tied to bottling. Again, you may or may not know the answer to this, but if you do, then, then this is going to be wonderful for one of our listeners. He wants to know what happens to everything that's filtered out of the whiskey when chill filtration happens? What happens with that byproduct? Uh, great question. It's used for, by and large, flavoring. So if you go to Scotland um, and you go to any... You know, Scotland, we love tourists. You know, we love people coming to Scotland and buying stuff. Um, and so, you know, one of the great sort of staples, not, you know, outside Scotch whiskey, of course, is the those whiskey flavored marmalades, whiskey flavored this, whiskey. Yeah, flavored. sure. So a lot of that. So what what, um, what what when you chill filtering, you're filtering out a lot of the, you know, the um, globules of color, the proteins, the contributors from the wood. There's there's oils there, etc. Lipid fats, etc. So on and so forth. So that is an is absorbed into these uh, filter pads and. Um, there's some rich flavor there. In fact, a lot of Scotch whiskey now is bottled that retains a lot of that stuff. You know, the, like this 15 years old Glen Grant non-chill filter. So, you know, sure. there's, they're, they're retaining that flavor. But I have a friend actually who makes uh, jams and, uh, you know, honey, whiskey flavored honey and all that stuff. And, and he actually goes and buys that uh, matter, solid matter that's filtered out during that process. So interesting because when he asked that question, I realized I had never even thought what would be done with that, mm -hmm. right? You, you think about whiskey production yeah. and you know what happens to the barley afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you feed it to the cows, but mm -hmm. this other byproduct I'd never even thought about. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Have you ever thought about that, Jason? That byproduct, no one ever talks about that byproduct. It's just I'm not a thing. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you and say I haven't. 
Yeah. <laughs> this this large pile of gelatinous material <laughs> has not really entered into my brain. But it, yeah, it's, it's an absolute spot on question. I love the fact that Robin was ready to go with an answer on that. It also has an echo to what Dr. Kirsty had said when we interviewed her about when the distillery is running the column still mm. at the grain distillery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this percentage comes off and goes to that industry. And this other percentage of alcohol ah. comes off and goes to that industry. Yeah. Right? There, you know, the whiskey industry is supplying other industries with its byproducts beyond the draft that goes to cows that always leads to that silly comment about happy cows uh, as if there's alcohol in draft. But, (laughs) you know, maybe they're they're happy getting the draft. Yeah, could just be delicious food for them. Yummy, yummy draft. Yeah. And now we've got an email from Dan Grison. And the subject is simply, thank you. And so Dan says... Hi guys, I just wrapped up the latest episode and as always, well done. I wanted to thank you for giving me something very special in this episode. Allow me to explain. Just that first segment of his email got me so excited and then when you hear it. Anyway, I'll go on. I have a 12... I was going to say, if you ever want us to open any email about anything, just put thank you in the subject. We will 100%... (laughs) Open that email immediately. Uh-huh. Um, I will say if, if it turns out to not be an email uh, about a thank you, we might never open another email from you if you've pay, played such a nefarious trick on us. But, you know, that, them's the chances you take. Uh, uh. So Dan says, uh, I have a 12-year-old daughter who listens to music that I would consider painfully bad. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Just eavesdrop in on a TikTok video and there you go. (laughs) Yeah, painfully bad. I think I got their first album. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But he goes on, he says, of course she has a similar opinion of my music, right? Makes sense. Even still, I try to talk to her about the importance of lyrics and telling a story and having meaningful and emotional connects to the song, both from a listener and performer perspective. Anyway, tonight as I was driving her to her cheer practice, I was allowed to control the radio. She (laughs) said, I love that part. Just just for one second there, right? I think every single one of us, if if the 20-year-old version of us could see the dad version of us, the thought that you would ever lose the the music machine in your own car Mm -hmm. never once crossed our mind and we are all living that life Uh it's all a case of you had it last time now it's my turn okay fair fair oh gosh it's amazing that we all live these lives solidarity dan solidarity exactly so he he was allowed to control the radio station and she said that she wants to get more into music I was thrilled. Even if I don't like what she listens to, I'm excited she wants to explore and expand such an amazing form of art. Music just has a way of connecting emotions and experiences and memories like little else. Yeah, I would say another thing that does that is whiskey. I I think the the two... (laughs) She's 12, Joshua. She's 12. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's music for six years and then whiskey. Oh, wait. Oh, no, <laughs> Not she's, in the UK. We're in America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and nine year a wink. <laughs> uh, just to be very clear, neither Jason nor I are suggesting, Dan, that you give your daughter whiskey. I'm just saying when she's 21, you know, that's, that's another thing for you to introduce her to. Anyway. <laughs> So he said, he goes on, he says, fresh off this episode, I started talking about what Will said about how his music is consumed. And I talked with her about how albums can tell a story versus an artist today just dropping a song and moving on to the next single. She was really into the conversation and listened when I told her how much fun it could be to bring home a new record, put it on a turntable and listen to it while examining the record jacket. 
Now she wants me to take her to my local record shop and look around and talk to the owner. I, I have chills just reading. Like so literal cool. Chills, right? <laughs> it's um, so awesome. Goosebumps on the goosebumps. Right, right. And uh, I'll, I'll have a little bit of a story to add on in, in a bit. But anyway, so he goes on. This is the final paragraph. He says, I have no idea where this trip to the store will lead. I doubt she will jump on the Bonnie Prince Billy bandwagon. But for now, I want to say thank you for facilitating an amazing 20-minute conversation with my daughter, one that hopefully helps create a bond between us for years to come. Those are the memories I hold dear, and I just had to share this story with you. Cheers, guys. Dan. That is beautiful. Absolutely Absolutely beautiful. As someone who grew up with an uncle who ran a record store, like a legit record store with, you know, unusual pressings and different, you know, this release from Japan and just, you know, it was an oasis for music discovery. And my uncle played such a part in my musical discovery. You know, I think I may have mentioned this on the podcast before. At age, at age six for my birthday, he bought me the first Ramones album and Black Sabbath Paranoid. And I uh, fell in love. Every, right? every time I see and hear Black Sabbath, I think of you getting that album yes. from your uncle. And, and so th- th- that did a couple of things. First off, at six years old, I heard Geezer Butler's bass guitar. At six years old, I knew I wanted to be a bass player because I loved the sound. But then I would say how much I loved these, and my uncle slash the record store owner would say, oh, you liked that? Here, let's go down this rabbit hole. Let's, you like the Ramones? Let's give the Sex Pistols a try. Let's give the Subhumans a try. Let's give Dead Kennedys a try. Look, you like Black Sabbath? What's Hawkwind like? What's this like? And I, you know, if you find the passion in that music, having that record store owner is, you know, that that's that's your rabbi right there. That's your priest. That's someone you listen to uh, to help you navigate that rabbit hole. And I and I think, you know, hopefully, Dan, you know, your daughter be- between you and the person running the shop. You know, hopefully she finds whatever rabbit hole she's looking for in music and and has joy. And whether you like the music or not, so long as she's enjoying it and she's able to find a connection with new music and a deeper connection with new music, then that record store owner did his job and you as a as a parent did your job. I, I think it's just really great stuff. And I, I wasn't kidding when I said... This email gave me goosebumps. I, I connected 100%. to it hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, but but here's the thing, and, and obviously Dan is a, a terrific supporter of the nation and and the podcast. The connection that you and I get to enjoy with members of the nation is second to none. But also, the connection that members of the nation are experiencing with one another. Mm. is really fantastic. And, and not to harken back again, I, I, I'm almost apologetic for mentioning this again. One of the reasons for bringing back the State of the Nation is during this time of lockdown, we've lost so many of our communities, so many of the places where we saw one another and mm-hmm. shook hands and hugged and shared drams. We've lost so many of those outlets mm-hmm. that... Yep. Our Facebook page, our private members only Facebook page has become an incredible community. And and I've said it many times and you've said it about me many times. I passionately hate Facebook and avoid it like the plague. (laughs) I have now, well, I don't like admitting this. I've now made a little 10 minute window in each of my weekday mornings to go on to our private members only Facebook page, read the latest posts, like things, love things, give the little hug emoji where necessary. And with their blessing, I'd like to share 
a couple of stories that are on there that just like Dan's email that he took the time to send in to us, mm -hmm. these stories gave me chills and mm -hmm. gave me goosebumps on the goosebumps. Mm -hmm. And and um, I'm going to share them. Please, yeah. And the reason, I've, the reason I'm, I'd like to do this is because one is from Matt Skinny Roberts, who we've interviewed... And he's sent in his own questions. We've actually interviewed him twice on twice. the podcast. That is very true. <laughs> and he sends in his own questions and he purchases Single Cast Nation bottles. He's a terrific, terrific supporter and he's a name that our listeners know. And then the other one is Christopher Sebastian, who has also written in and has participated in the, the BYO SCNB events that mm -hmm. we've done and, mm -hmm. and we've seen them there. And so these are people that I really feel deeply connected to. And Same. once you hear the stories they're sharing, you can tell they are feeling deeply connected to the nation as well. So so first up is Matt Skinny Roberts posting on September 29 at 10.37 p.m. East Coast time. I've been debating on posting this, but being that we all connect over whiskey and some of us have deep connections to certain distilleries brands, I figured it was worth sharing. I'll try to be brief. And then it's, it's four paragraphs here. I have had only one experience prior to this SCN bottling. It was not a good one, as you might gather from one of the photos. And so the, the two photos posted here, one is a, a, a bottle of Whistle Pig, as released by the distillery, sitting on it. It's hard to tell what it's sitting on. Um, the story will make it crystal clear what it's yeah. sitting on. Yep. And then the other one is a bottle of our newly released Single Cask Nation Whistlepig Collaboration, the Tokai Cask Finish, 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. On a lovely day, a new but fast friend of ours crashed his motorcycle in the front of the group we were riding with in northeast Oregon. We saw to him as best we could until help arrived and we could get him to an ambulance and then helicopter. Loading him onto the helicopter and talking with the medics, we assumed the best and rode back to the little town of Sumter where we were staying, or we were staying in. The next morning, we got the tragic news that he did not survive his injuries. We were then tasked with going into his room and collecting his belongings, one of which was the bottle of straight rye, this whistle pig bottle that was in the photo. He had mentioned it numerous times and was excited to share it, knowing we were whiskey people. As we stood around what was left of the bike, we silently passed it among ourselves and Meg, Skinny's partner, poured the final dram over the tank in his honour. Hmm. Since that weekend, I have not had a single drop of whistle pig and when these two came up, I was excited. I felt that either one of these bottles is worthy of toasting his memory. So tonight we are doing just that. And after tasting, oh my, 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 well done. This is a great collaboration. I look so forward to enjoying this bottle as it develops. Hmm. And that, that, got, that got 74 responses of the emoji type and seven comments from the nation, right? Yeah. And that's not easy to read. Yeah. And, and I can only imagine for Skinny what it was like to write. And so the fact that he would take the time to share that is absolutely remarkable. And <laughs> I'm trying to show that there's there are good corners on Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are good people in good corners of Facebook saying wonderful things and doing wonderful things. Yeah. And yeah. so also with that in mind, here's a, a later story that Christopher Sebastian, only known as Seabass, uh, he posted this on September 30. And this is a, another uh, terrific story. Again, four paragraphs, a uh, little bit lengthier, but such a terrific story. And so he posts a photo of the Mezcal Fidencio, the Reposada, that we mm -hmm. released to Single Cast Nation Online. And he's got it sitting on top of Ron Cooper's book, Finding Mezcal, which is on my shelf behind me. And I, I just haven't got around to reading it yet. I only purchased it in the last couple of months. And so Seabass says, emptied this bottle last night for a good cause, wanted to share a story about how bottles can span cultural gaps. 
Yesterday evening, we had a small, outdoor, socially distanced, the whole nine yards, gathering to say goodbye to our upstairs neighbours who have been stuck here from Mexico since February because of COVID. (laughs) The mom and daughter were visiting the grandparents when the pandemic hit, and because of the uncertainty of travel and health issues, stayed here throughout. We celebrated the little girl's first birthday and first steps with them, as her father missed milestone after milestone being stuck down in Oaxaca. My two kids became good friends with the new addition to our small apartment complex, sharing toys and playing together when safe and possible. (laughs) Fortunately, the father, husband, was able to come up from Mexico for the last couple of months to be with his family, and we were able to get to know him a bit. Last night was the longest time we spent together, As with most apartments, you mainly just get a chance to say hi and bye in passing. But he was always willing to talk with us, regardless of the language barrier. Last evening, as a few of us sat outside in the darkness, chatting in his broken English and my more broken Spanish, (laughs) I thought I would offer the group some pours of mezcal. I saw Emilio light up in a way that he had never before eagerly anticipated, eagerly accepting the offer. After some Del McGay Tobala pours, during which he showed us pictures of his friend who distills mezcal and talked to the group about the history of the drink in their culture, we finished off the SCN Fidencio Reposado, which I had been holding on to for too long. Turns out this was the perfect occasion. Hmm. Like, what a situation right? to find yourself a part of. <laughs> How Fucking magnificent. Yeah. Uh, last last paragraph. It was so beautiful to see how something as simple as a drink can help us form bonds regardless of the impediment. Mm. The culture of whiskey is strong in this way, and yet I rarely have had the language barrier come into play. Thanks to the nation for helping me get more into the beauty that is mezcal, allowing for a truly wonderful evening of human connection that I might have missed out on otherwise. Between skinny and sea bass here, I'm like fresh out of tears. I'm fresh out of chills. Like this is, you know, in 2011, when you and I launched this company, we had said we want to launch it around the building of a community. And here we are, right? 10 years later, and that community continues to build and only deepen in connections. Yeah, this is really special. Really special. So this has been an incredible segment of the podcast. I'm <laughs> like you, I'm getting a little verklempt over here. And and I, I we need to get out of here. We're not gonna last much longer. But we actually received some gifts from a nation member who's a tremendous supporter uh-huh. and and yeah. also a chap who's very active on the Facebook group um, uh, and is on Instagram. You, you'll see him as the Whiskey Nerd. Mm-hmm. Big, big, big Kilhoman fan uh, who lives in Arizona. I think he's okay with us sharing that information. But I have a handwritten card, just like we got our letter from Vadim that we read um, here's a handwritten card from Travis, and then you you can tell our listeners more about what we received. Okay. But but he, here's the card. So Travis writes, Jason, I just want to thank you for all that you have done for me and the whiskey community. Please enjoy the gifts. He names them, but I'm going to save that for you, Joshua. I hope the samples taste that much better with them. <laughs> the gifts. <laughs> I've been listening back to the pad costs, which you and I always say, God, we love it when people call it that, and love your relationship that you have with Joshua. It's rare to have this type of genuine friendship in business and in life. It really shows how much you value each other. The banter and conversation is second to none. Your sense of humor has allowed me to have a little fun as well. <laughs> And then he goes on to describe the uh, the mm-hmm, gift. Mm-hmm. I look forward to seeing what you have planned next for all of us in the whiskey world. 
Cheers, Travis. And, and when he mentioned samples there, this connects so beautifully to the beginning or the early portion of the podcast when you talked about Kilhoman telling the story of their releases. Mm-hmm. Travis and I share an affinity for Kilhoman anticipation. <laughs> uh-huh. And he s- sent us, <laughs> I'm looking at it on your video there, he <laughs> sent us samples of anticipation, which is so very, very kind. I I currently do not have a bottle of anticipation. I don't have any samples of anticipation. And so this was wonderful to receive. Uh, I'm also going to throw out, I also got the Colhoman single cask as bottled for specs. Mm-hmm. And uh, Murray McDavid, uh, 20-year-old Tobermory in a Madeira barrique. And I, I messaged him and I said, I'm, I'm really into Madeira finishes and maturations right now. And so that was a perfect sample to send. That's, uh, yeah, and so he, so... He had sent both you and I, Jason, uh, two Glen Cairns. One Glen Cairn says on it what it is, what we do, that we do. And then, very smart, which has been the the tagline of the podcast. And then the other one has a one side of a broken heart. (laughs) And on your glass, Inside half a broken heart is the name Joshua. And in my glass, I've got a Jason, which is so freaking silly and and hilarious and just great fun. Uh, Can said, I say, yeah, go ahead. when those glasses came in and, and my wife looked over the gifts <laughs> from, from Travis, uh-huh. she was like, I have to text Haida right now, right now. And and I said, no, Joshua's package has been delayed. He doesn't know what he has yet. And she said, you tell me as soon as his package comes in and he opens it, because I am texting Haida because both of our wives talk about us being the other one's work wife. <laughs> and so they uh-huh. are all over this. They They think we are ridiculous. And Travis, you have only furthered that. So thank you very much. <laughs> and then finally, to go along with the glasses and the samples, uh, Travis made up these like little miniature staves that hold a Glencairn on it. It's got the Single Cast Nation logo on it. It's just absolutely beautiful and so kind and thoughtful incredibly well put together incredibly well put I, together I, I use this anytime I'm drinking from a Glencairn one, you know I've been <laughs> I've been using the ones from Travis I just sit them in this you cannot knock over your Glencairn if no, I'm working exactly. in yep. you know keyboard and trackpad the Glencairn is 100% secure in this a wonderful wonderful gift yep yeah th- this holds you know if I'm sipping on a whiskey while I'm doing some work this holds my Glencairn so is really, really generous. Thank you again, Travis. Blew me away. I, I couldn't believe it. Same, same. I know we need to get out of here, but A, we need to tell people how to get in touch with us. And one of the ways that people can get in touch with us is a new way, and someone actually got in touch with us in this way. So we've been telling listeners, you know, of course you can you can email us questions at one nation under whiskey.com. You could tweet at us at one nation whiskey. You can go to the Facebook place and just search for one nation under whiskey and send us messages there. You can Instagram us at one nation under whiskey. Anyway, we've also been telling people if you want to send us physical mail, if you want to be pen pals, whatever, if you just want to send us a letter, you can send it to P.O. Box 335, Guilford, Connecticut. That's G-U-I-L-F-O-R-D. 06437 is your zip code. And we would read whatever you sent us live on, well, not live on air, but we'd read it in the podcast. And so, uh, listener... Would they top... Yeah. Yeah. Would they top that with One Nation Under Whiskey or J&J Spirits or Single Cast Nation or Jason and Joshua or Three J's? Does it matter what they put at the top? Is the P.O. box the important detail? 
The P.O. Box is the important detail. This letter, and I have to go back to our, our P.O. Box and see if we've got anything else coming in. But this one came to J&J Spirits. Awesome. Okay. And so this is from uh, listener slash nation member Paul Marco. Good lad. And Paul says, J&J Pad Costers. And, Boom. And, so first off, this was on a, um, uh, on a postcard, Okay. Uh, so this wasn't a letter, it was a postcard. And I love receiving postcards. Mm-hmm. And it says, J&J Pad Costers, greetings. Please accept this postcard as my entry for the contest slash drawing to win a <laughs> bottle of whiskey and the Indiana Jones secret decoder ring. Cheers, <laughs> Paul Marco. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, so good. So, what was on the front of the postcard? Uh, right. So, it was a portrait of Napoleon the Third. Interesting. Yep. I wonder why he chose that. That's a good question. Well, let's read the back of it. What does it say? It says, "Portrait of the Napoleon the Third after Winter Halter, Museum mm. of the Second Empire." And then there's stuff in, in French, and uh, my French is not so great. Paul Marco is clearly planning on marching into single cast nation and then freezing and starving to death in the fields. <laughs> Checks out. Checks out. The messaging is clear. It's clear. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you, Travis. Yeah, cheers, buddy. Right? Thank you, Seabass. Thank you, Skinny. Thank you, Dan Grison. Thank you, Robin Cooper and Jason. Thanks to our listeners and thanks to you. This has been so much fun. Absolutely wonderful to, to cover. Just so, so much connection. That's mm-hmm. what I'm taking away from this episode. Mm-hmm. It's this just feeling of connection with a wider nation and a global nation. And we're being asked when the next BYOSCNB event will be. Talk about connections, talk about nations. Talking about global, we would like that next Bring Your Own Single Cast Nation Bottle event to be a global mm-hmm. event. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're, we're probably going to do it on a Sunday. Uh, we'll probably have to work out some times to, to get as many time zones involved as possible. Mm-hmm. But we are, we're eager for it. it. It will not happen in October, but I'd love to get something on the books for November. It'd be brilliant. Yep, we will work on that. We will work on that. All right, Jason, I think it's about damn time you and I ended the podcast and let our listeners get on with their day. Peas out. Visualize world peas. That's one of my least favorite bumper stickers. Mine is coexist. Did you see the, uh, this is this is great. There was, there was some like Onion article or maybe it was the Hard Times or maybe it was the Daily Mash where the headline was simply hundreds of thousands of coexist bumper stickers recalled for being ineffective. <laughs> I did see that. Uh, I did, I did, I did. Oh, so good. can we all just get along? Uh, apparently not. All right. Jason, I bid you adieu. I bid you adieu also. I bid you a Scotsman. <laughs> no true Scotsman. <laughs> boom, ba, ba, dum, boom, 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 boom.